dismissed to your Sunday school classes. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that this day you would feed us from the bread of life. We would ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 He is risen. He is risen indeed. Today, like we have the past three years that we have spent together celebrating Resurrection Sunday, also known as Easter, we're going to do something a little bit different than the norm, and I'm going to encourage you to use your imaginations as I share with you uh, a story. And we're going to go on an imaginary journey this morning that involves a, a biblical narrative that may very well be true about a real biblical figure that we all know as the Roman centurion. And so let me introduce to you this morning Marcus. Marcus was born into a military family as his father and his father before him both served in the Roman army. And during Marcus's lifetime, Rome dominated much of the Mediterranean world and even beyond. It was Caesar Augustus who was born in 63 BC and came into power in 31 BC who was the Roman emperor during the time of Jesus's life and ministry here on earth. And he was the ruler that Marcus would serve under and would pledge his allegiance to. Augustus, also known as Octavian, after defeating the enemies of Rome, he was celebrated as a great savior and a great deliverer to the people and was largely a hero to the citizens of Rome because he ushered in what is commonly referred to as the Pax Romana or the peace of Rome. And Marcus was amongst that group who was fiercely loyal to this popular emperor and was amongst those who fought against the many rebels who caused civil unrest in their attempt to overthrow Augustus and therefore overthrow the Roman Empire. And it was at the height of his reign that Augustus would actually rule over 25 legions of soldiers. That's 125,000 men that he led and that he ruled over. Soldiers who would hold a high place of favor as he always rewarded them and he always compensated them very generously and very handsomely for their service and their devotion to Rome. And then, of course, it's emperor. And during Marcus's entire life, Rome had dominion over the nation of Israel. It was in 63 BC, after much turmoil and civil war amongst the Jews, that the Romans invaded and they conquered Jerusalem and in turn the Jewish people. And this, of course, if you know your history, was nothing new to the Jews as they had previously been conquered and made subject to Babylon and then after Babylon, Assyria and then after Assyria, it was Persia and then after Persia, it was the Greeks and then eventually they were made subject to Rome and the Roman Empire. And it was there in Jerusalem that Marcus lived and he served in the Roman army. As a matter of fact, Marcus, as you would imagine, was born a citizen of Rome, and with that came additional privileges and perks that he would often take advantage of. And because he lived in Jerusalem, Marcus worked directly under Herod, 
the king of Judea, who had been appointed king by Julius Caesar. You may remember that name. He was Augustus's father, and it was Pontius Pilate who served as governor in that region under Herod that Marcus reported to directly. And it was Herod, you might recall, in the Christmas story about the birth of Christ, who would order the slaughter of all the male-born children, two years old and younger, when he was told by some magi, by some wise men, that the king of the Jews had been born in Israel. And therefore, Marcus, although he was fairly young at the time, due to his family name, and the influence of his deceased grandfather and now his retired father, he was what they called a centurion, a commander of at least 100 soldiers, oftentimes more. And Marcus would obey Herod's orders and lead his men in the slaughter of these innocent children in an attempt to destroy the one who was this so-called king of the Jews who could possibly pose a threat to the rule and the reign of the Roman Empire. And even though Marcus never lifted a finger to slay any of the children in the cell, it was still under this man's command that hundreds were slaughtered and blood filled the streets even as the cries and wails of the people filled the air. And even though Marcus was a, as true to Rome as any soldier could possibly be, he could never, ever quite escape the guilt or remove from his mind what the scripture refers to and history refers to as the slaughter of the innocents and the grave injustice that took place under his command on that fateful day. And this is why his first exposure to Jesus Christ was so profound. Marcus was amongst a number of soldiers whom he was leading who were present during the time of the Sermon on the Mount. And in light of the oppression that he knew the nation of Israel had suffered for hundreds and hundreds of years and in light of his own involvement in oppressing God's people. He was truly marveling when he heard Jesus speak forth these words. Blessed are you when people insult you and they persecute you and they say falsely all kinds of evil against you because of me. I say rejoice. I say be glad. For you see your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then later on he heard Jesus say, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And it was with each word that came forth from Jesus' mouth that Marcus recalled that terrible day some 30 years earlier at this time. And it was like a spear pierced through his heart and he could hold the, hardly hold back the key. Nor could he explain how one day when he was up in the region of Galilee on assignment that he heard that this so-called Messiah was nearby teaching the masses. And so out of curiosity and for the purpose of crowd control, Marcus and a number of other soldiers under him followed a crowd of about 5,000 men to what was this beautiful, natural, outside amphitheater. And Marcus saw with his own eyes something he could not believe. He saw how Jesus took a cup of fish and just five loaves of bread. And before everybody's eyes miraculously multiplied them again, and again, and again, 
and again, and how he had his disciples distribute the fish and the loaves throughout the crowd, and how every person who was hungry that day was filled. And Marcus would often wonder if his eyes deceived him, because what he witnessed and what he saw was beyond the ordinary, you see. It was extraordinary. It was something that had no natural explanation that could be attributed to it. For all intents and purposes, though he tried to deny it, Marcus knew that he witnessed a miracle. But he really forbid himself to think much about it. You see, his, his job was to protect Rome, not try to figure out some traveling preacher or some traveling prophet that did tricks with fish and, and bread. That wasn't his concern. He also remembered standing next to some Pharisees that day who were also there, and they also witnessed the same miracle. But instead of being amazed and astounded as Marcus was, they were very angry. And they were aggravated. And, they, and Marcus heard them say amongst themselves, this magician and this false messiah who fools the people of God must surely die. Yes, he must be put to death. And they stormed off in anger oblivious, really, to the crowd that was there laughing and rejoicing and eating up the goodness of God's provision. But you see, that's what hard-hearted, doubting, disbelieving people have to do when they are faced with the truth and they are faced with a miraculous God. There was another time when Marcus was on assignment up in Galilee, that he had a profound second-hand encounter with Jesus through a comrade of his who also happened to be a Roman centurion. But he was much different from Marcus as he was actually a friend of the Jews and a believer in the one who others were calling the Christ, the Son of the living God. This man's name was Titus. And Titus, this Roman centurion, though he was discreet, he would oftentimes tell Marcus about this man from Galilee, and he would recite his teachings from memory. And Marcus knew him before Titus began to follow this teacher of righteousness, as the Essenes would call him. And Marcus knew that Titus was a changed man before and after his conversion. For at one point, Titus was also a very cold-hearted soldier who led and participated in acts of injustice under the rule of Rome. And it was because of his cruelty towards the Jews early on in his life that after his conversion, he vowed to befriend them and to bless them whenever possible, and thus the reason why he gave a very generous and, and large contribution to the Jews to help them build their synagogue. Well, one day, Titus's servant, also a believer in this man from Galilee, he grew gravely ill. And Titus summoned a doctor for help, but really to no avail as he told Titus that his servant only had a few hours at most to live and that there was really nothing that he could do to help him except for, for possibly relieve some of the pain. And so being desperate, Titus had heard that Jesus was actually in the area. And so not thinking himself worthy to be in Jesus' presence, he sent some of his Jewish friends from the synagogue in search of this one who was also known as a miracle worker. And he asked them that if they found Jesus, to please, 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 on behalf 
of my beloved servant, who is really more like a son to Titus than he was a servant. Because you see, he was born and he was raised and he grew up in Titus's home. And so Titus always felt a kindredness towards him and viewed him and, and, and in many ways treated him like his son. And Marcus remembered how bad he felt for his friend Titus. And yet, also how naive he thought that he was when he heard that Titus thought that this Jesus could somehow, some way, do something or anything really to help his dying servant who was just really minutes, if not hours, away from death. And yet, much to his surprise, Later that day, when Titus reported to work, Marcus fully expected to see a grieving man who had just lost a loved one. But you see, Marcus did witness tears. But these were tears of sheer joy. As Titus recounted to him, how his Jewish friends had indeed come upon Jesus and how they indeed pleaded with Jesus in regard to Titus and his beloved servant and if he would have mercy on him. If he would just say the word. And Marcus hears Titus tell him, that even before his Jewish friends could return and report their encounter with Jesus, right before his very eyes, he sees his servant slash son raised from the sick bed, from what would be a death bed if Jesus would not have intervened. And Marcus, upon hearing this, he just stood speechless. Because he knew that his friend and that his comrade would never, ever lie about such a thing. And plus he saw the pure joy that was on his face, that flowed from his face and his countenance when he told him the story of how Jesus healed his loved one. Well, another time, while back in Jerusalem, Marcus and another soldier was stabbed by one of the extreme zealots, a man who may remember the name by the name of Barabbas. And even though the other soldier died instantly, it was a disciple of Jesus who saw the stabbings and he ran to and cared for and he prayed over Marcus until he was able to get some medical care. And Marcus, during that time, had felt his very own life slipping away. But th there was something about this follower of Christ. And the way that he prayed over him and touched him, that not only gave Marcus hope, but actually stopped the flow of blood and enabled him to be healed. And Marcus eventually fully recovered from his wounds. And shortly after he was stabbed, thankfully, this man named Barabbas was arrested and he was thrown into prison to await trial for murder and for attempted murder and assault. Something that had many eyewitnesses to it and surely he would be found guilty of this horrendous crime. And yet Marcus, he was always struck by the kindness and the gentleness and the compassion of this Christ follower. Really someone who, for all intents and purposes, would have every reason in the world to hate him and despise him and to turn his back on him because of Marcus's role in oppressing this group of Christ's followers. And yet, this Christ follower, this disciple 
of Jesus showed him love and compassion unlike anything he had ever seen or witnessed or experienced before in his life. Well, needless to say, when Jesus was arrested and betrayed in the garden, and then he was put on trial before the people in front of Pontius Pilate, and the Pharisees stacked the crowd in their favor. Marcus was quite disturbed when Pontius Pilate acquiesced to the crowd's chant, Release unto us Barabbas! Release unto us Barabbas! Well, what shall I do with him? Pointing to Jesus. Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! And Marcus stood next to a battered, beat, and bloody Jesus. A man who was so disfigured from his beatings that Marcus hardly recognized him from the one who stood smiling and laughing and rejoicing and holding a child in his arms after he performed the miracle with the fish and the bread. And it was Marcus's unfortunate responsibility to take this supposed king of the Jews and a couple of other criminals to a hill called Golgotha where they would be crucified and be put to death. But Marcus knew, really, deep down inside of his heart, that the only thing that Jesus was truly guilty of was love. Was love. That was the only thing that he could be tried and convicted of. And that he saw that it was the love in Jesus' eyes, not a transgression that he committed against any law that was truly driving him and truly taking him to the cross. And it was about this time as Jesus is, is stepping and then stumbling along the Via Della Rosa, this road leading, leading up to Calvary's hill, that things finally quit. And that it finally dawned on Marcus that this was how it had to be. As he faintly remembered the words of Titus, that he had shared with him in earlier conversations and they kept rolling around in his head and he could not escape them with every step that Jesus made towards the cross. He heard the words, like a lamb led to the sky. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. And while on Calvary's hill and the soldiers are nailing Jesus to the cross, Marcus got sick to his stomach as he saw his fellow soldiers casting lots and laughing and mocking and, and casting these lots over Jesus' garments in just the brutal, hateful, disgraceful way this innocent man was being treated at the hands of people that he knew were true sinners, deserving of the very faith that they had pronounced upon Jesus. And for what seemed like an eternity, Marcus stood and he watched Jesus suffer tremendously in pain and in agony on the cross as his blood mingled with sweat dripped onto the ground. But it was when a certain moment occurred. It was when Jesus looked down from the cross and his eyes met Marcus's eyes that everything changed 
when he heard these words. Father, forgive them. And it was as Jesus breathed his last breath that true revelation came. And Marcus said out loud and unashamedly what he had suspected all along but dared to believe. Truly, this was the Son of God. Loved ones, so he was, and so he is. And it was in that instant that Marcus's life was forever changed. And you know what? The same thing can be said of anyone here today that comes to that same revelation that truly Jesus was and is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, if any man is in Christ, he is an altogether new person. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And in closing, you might find it interesting to know that it was also Marcus in our imaginary narrative today who was one of the more than 500 followers of Christ who saw Jesus after he rose from the dead that the Apostle Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first six verses. Please listen to these words. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, that is the good news which I preached to you, which also you received. You see, when you hear, you have to receive. In which you also stand, and once you receive, you must stand in that truth, in that belief, by which you are also say, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Loved ones, he is risen. Did you join with me? He is risen in peace. Would you stand with me? Let's bow our heads and, and pray. And just as you are reflecting upon this one who truly was and is the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God, if you've never really made that step of faith and that proclamation, even as Marcus did in our story, as he did in the Word of God, he truly is the Son of God. He loved you. He died for you. He rose from the dead for you so that you might have everlasting life. It's the best deal, the best deal ever given to the world. And it's at your disposal this morning. All you have to do is believe. You can't earn it. You can't bargain for it. You can't buy it. It's a free gift. And you will be saved by grace alone, 
through faith alone, in Christ alone. Father, I pray for each person here that they would be touched with this story of the gospel, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the soon coming return of King Jesus, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And I pray that salvation would come today, that healing, that restoration would come today, and that each person here would leave this place knowing that they know that truly Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's in his name that we say, Amen.
Amen. May your day be filled with the reality of resurrection and redemption. Happy Easter. God bless you all.